This is a geek leader. Hey guys, John Rauta back again with episode 55 of A Geek Leader, and today we have Andrew May, and Andrew is the uh, co-founder of Cotanks Labs and a software development company, and he also was a board member from Codestock for a few years, and we also have Brad Miller, who makes a cameo appearance on the show uh, for a little bit, and he is a senior board member for the Codestock Conference in Knoxville. We talk about trust, we talk about building teams, we talk about... Um, what it's like to actually merge companies together whenever you're, you're working on your own and, um, and a lot about hiring and kind of moving into providing the right culture for your team. It's a pretty good episode. I, I really love talking to these guys. They have lots of good knowledge. So give it up for Andrew May and Brad Miller. And we're live. I'm here with Andrew May and uh, Brad Miller is also standing by. Andrew, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? I know you are uh, co-founder and CEO of CodeTank and former board member of CodeStock. And uh, Brad, I think you also work over there at CodeTank as director of operations and are the sen- and is currently the senior board member of CodeStock. Is that correct? That's right, uh, yeah. Brad. Absolutely. So uh, give everyone a little background about myself. So Andrew May. Uh, I've been in the tech world for many, many years since I was a child, uh, one of those nerds who grew up around uh, computing. Uh, but I've had my own company for at least 10 years. Uh, before Cotank Labs, it was a company called ADM Software. Uh, three years ago, ADM Software and another company, uh, Double Apps, uh, kept running into each other at our clients' offices. Uh, Uh, All across the country, we would fly into different places and just, I'd be like, hey, Dave, don't you live in Knoxville? And so one day, jokingly, one of our clients kind of said, hey, can can you guys just send us one invoice instead of two? It's easier on us. He and I kind of laughed and realized, wait a minute, this this might not be a half bad idea. Um, and, And we talked and discovered there's a lot of a uh, good overlap here that we could take the business even further. So three years ago, he and I joined forces and took our respective companies, brought it into CodeTank Labs, and have expanded to 12 developers. Uh, we are primarily focused in uh, mobile technologies, native mobile technologies, iOS, Android, and uh, we're getting into in this past year a lot of uh, AR and VR. Uh, so we're really proud of that stuff. and really pleased with what we've done, how far we've taken the company and growing the company. Uh, so, and of course, I can't forget about this as either. Uh, Brad would be upset. Uh, also was involved with code stock uh, and really took it from about, uh, when, I, when I took it over originally, around 400, 450 uh, attendees to when I left, uh, just shy of 1,000. So I helped grow that into the conference it is now, and uh, I've handed that over to Brad. And and there's a reason for that. Uh, You can't have two senior members of a company run a nonprofit uh, conference without learning that you're going to have to shut down your organization for about six weeks. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's uh, nice to know. Um, but I, I've I've always loved going to Code Stock. I've been going to Code Stock for quite a while, pretty much since um, I learned about Code Stock while I was actually at DevLink. If that tells you uh, how long ago that's been, because uh, DevLink hasn't been around for it's, it's been shut down for a while now. Um, but I, I appreciate all that you guys do and putting that that event on. Um, I feel like although the the sessions are great, the speakers are great, um, and you know, pat my own back a little bit there as I speak there <laughs> occasionally. But the the information you get in between the sessions and in, in the conversations in the open spaces that is just invaluable to me. So that that actually brings on a good point of what Code Stock is and something I try and bring not only to to Code Tank, uh, but to Code Stock is uh, community. Uh, and culture. Uh, you, you need to bring a good community and culture to, to everything you touch. Uh, so in terms of code stock, I really felt like we needed to make sure that there was time to uh, uh, network with people in between sessions, that it wasn't just you're getting a shotgun of knowledge and no rest time, that uh, you're right, in between the sessions is when great things would happen. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it's when the magic would happen. In fact, uh, Knoxville has a great community called Knox Devs, and it was in between sessions that uh, Cody Lambert and Adrian Carr, two local Knox developers, said, hey, other cities have these Slack channels and communities together, and it's great that we've got code stock once a year, but what if we had something where, you know, all year long we had a Slack channel for people to talk to? So that happened. There, there's quite a bit of examples of that happening. Uh, and, and part of that is, again, culture and bringing the right speakers. So pat yourself on the back. Uh, you bring the right speakers, uh, you're, you're bound to bring the right attendees. So that, that's another big portion of it. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, Code Tank. You, that merger, what kind of challenges came about when you when you take, you know, I guess your own company that you started and you have another leader that also started their own company and you want to put those two things together and you have to give up some of that control yet still maintain, you know, identities and relationships with, with employees as well as with uh, customers. How, how, was that, how did that work out? So that, that is a uh, not an easy answer. The, the, <laughs> Let's go into the long, long, long answer here. First things first, we had to make sure we really matched Dave and I. We we always had kind of we've had lunches together, we hung out together sometimes when we could. Uh, but then we realized, hey, look, if we're going to work together and, and, and see each other and see our you know people we've hired together every single day, we really need to start hanging out every single day, saying we can't deal with this. Again, it goes back to that that culture. Uh, as long as Dave and I were on the same path, we could, we could work together. And so he and I spent a lot of time together, uh, just seeing if we would mesh together, you know, and and we did, uh, he and I see eye to eye in many things. Uh, and we did not have that culture clash that can happen when two companies come together. Uh, instead what happened was we came together and, and, almost uh, overnight just doubled in size uh, due to everything that we were bringing and offering to our clients. Now, there were challenges, obviously, uh, understanding each other's workflows, um, who would take the lead, you know, how do we split up responsibilities. Uh, Now, again, the nice thing is Dave and I have been doing this so long, uh, just informally before making it formal, that it came second nature to us. You know, one of the things I'd recommend to anyone who's looking to partner up with someone or, or take another company and merge it, spend time with them, go to their house, hang out with them, make sure you're not going to want to murder them in their sleep. Uh, because th- this is, this is like another marriage. Uh, this is someone that you are getting, getting together with, uh, in every way, you know, financially, responsibility, you know, responsibilities, it, you have to make sure you two really match. Without that, it's going to fall apart overnight. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I know um, I co-founded a web development company in 1999 that we ran for uh, seven years before selling it off with two of my fraternity brothers from college, and uh, you know, being the fact that we were in the fraternity, we knew each other for four years, you know, through college and founding a company together. I thought I knew them well, and, and you know they're they're great guys. But when you get into a business, you kind of learn more about them than you did, you know, from <laughs> from just the college days. I'll, I'll tell you, I know more about Brad than I ever knew beforehand, and th- this will go into my second piece of advice. Brad is a senior partner at Cotank. We we brought him in. I realized uh, one of the things Dave and I were missing. One of our strategic holes uh, were operations. Dave and I are right in front of the clients. We can manage teams, but day-to-day operations, HR, those kind of things, and even some biz dev uh, uh, outside of our comfort zone, we weren't good at. We needed to find someone who was good at that. Uh, Thankfully, I had been friends with Brad for a while and realized, hey, he's really good at this, Uh, and made him an offer to become a, a partner. But again, it wasn't just an overnight thing as we said, hey, look, we'll, we'll hire you, pay you, put you on a path to become a partner just to make sure it would work out. Uh, you learn more about the people you work with, uh, you know, than you could ever imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Um, so what what is it like, you know, 
hiring someone and having to bring them in and uh, you know putting trust that they're going to run the operations the way that you would. You know, I, I guess that's kind of a, a big deal of giving up some of that control. And uh, that's at me as a as a director now. That's one, been one of my hardest things is giving up control and allowing my managers to kind of take take things forward. I'll, I'll tell you that was a hard learning curve at first. Uh, I had always had you know employees underneath me, but I had you know tighter control being a smaller company. As we grew into a larger company and handing that off to Brad, uh, I'll tell you uh, it took my wife coming in saying, you need to remember you've got to delegate these things. You trust him. You hired him for a reason. Uh, So once I was smacked in the head a few times about that, I realized, okay, look, I did hire him for a reason. I trust him. I understand that he might not do things exactly how I do it, but he gets results. And he gets the results I'm looking for. So at that point, and and I'll tell you, it was a struggle. And you you, you can agree or disagree here, Brad. It took me a while to learn that. Uh, once I did though, things got even smoother and we were, we were able to grow even more because then I could shift my focus to other areas. Yeah, I know for me, that was one thing that I, when I struggled with that, I realized that the team would never get any further than I would allow it. And, you know, it, I was the bottleneck at that point and I needed to allow someone else to take on some of those things so I could think strategically to let it get even further. And, um, you know, that, that was a tough pill to swallow. But once you get past that, you realize that, yeah, they're not doing it maybe the way that I would. But, man, it works. And um, I don't want to stop something that, that that works. It's the end result that matters. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, if the leader is the bottleneck and cannot recognize that they are the bottleneck, then that's a problem. Uh, you know, when when – we've been looking to hire a new position for a project manager and we point blank, a project manager asked me, he said, you know, can you recognize if you're being a problem, what will you do if you are the problem? And the answer is I'll, I'll step aside. I'll let the people who need to take control, take control to get, get things done. Uh, but I, I quickly realized then, uh, you, you know, you've got to let people take control. And again, it might not be the way you want it, done exactly but if the results are there then great you know and uh, you can ask brad uh, I, I set some pretty you know high expectations around here uh and he constantly meets them so i i can't complain yeah no that's good you talked uh earlier about having a good culture and community to kind of build around your company and that that's really important to make sure you have that good culture. And I, I couldn't agree more. How is it that you develop that culture and make sure that when you're hiring someone that they fit that culture? So th- this is actually really interesting. Uh, in fact, since we're going through, we've got two open positions right now uh, and we're going through hiring. So I'm very fresh in my mind how we do this. It's almost like a, we're dating the individual. We bring them in before we even talk tech stack. Before we even really pour through the resume, if they've said, hey, I'd like to come work there, great, we want to talk to you. Uh, there's got to be a reason why you want to work here. Uh, bring them in, and we just chat with them, have some coffee with them, see what they're like. Uh, we try and figure out their personality type. Are they uh, an introvert? Are they an extrovert? Are they going to work well in our environment? Uh, we, we don't talk any tech at the first interview. Our, our interview process is course of what about four weeks yeah at least so we had about four weeks worth of of time from when we start now what happens sometimes and this is the only i feel negative side to this is they might find a better job elsewhere and that's fine good fit for them we need to make sure they're a good fit for us uh and this is going to sound on the creepy side of things when i hire someone i really want them to stay here as long as they can as long as they can uh, level up and mature as a developer and person. Uh, as long as they can do that, I want them here as long as possible. So I really want to make sure who I'm hiring has that ability and has the culture fit for that. Yeah, well, I think that's good for both you and the employee. I mean, that's a good financial decision because you don't have to – there's there's cost when it comes to training and losing a person and hiring someone. 
but also as an individual, there's costs when you shift jobs. There, there's that risk that you have to take on. There's the change of your routine, your schedule, your people that you've worked with. You lose relationships that you built over time, and you get new relationships. So there is that cost um, from the individual. So I think it is good whenever you find a place that you can be at for, for a long period of time. And I know here in, in where I'm at near Charlotte, we the average, I think the average developer is less than 18 months, you know, typical tenure at a job. And that's, um, you know, that's, that's unfortunate. Is one of the reasons why I started my own consulting firm is because of that. It's I kept seeing high turnover, and I kept asking my friends, "Where are you at now? Where are you at now?" And it was always someplace different. I was like, "Well, doesn't that kind of, kind of depressing?" And so, are you leveling up really? They're like, "No, I just keep making lateral moves. You know, I might get a different title, a little bit, or just a little bit bump in a the salary." They they weren't making any personal gains. They just kept switching jobs. They never actually really leveled up. So I thought to myself, I can't do that. I really don't want to do that. I want to continue to level up. I, I want to grow and I want to take people with me. Uh, and so, again, that's part of you know our interview process is like, where, where do you want to go? I, I want to see that they're willing to sit down and learn. Uh, people who, you know, do they have to live and breathe this? No. But if. I'd like to, if they, you know, want to continue to learn, I want people who want to go to conferences. I want people who want to go speak at conferences and they're a unique breed as you should know. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. And I, I look for the same thing and, um, I've tried to force that at my, at my last job and it didn't quite work. I tried to uh, encourage everyone to go speak at a meetup or a conference, you know, that was on their goals for the year. And I think some people, I, I didn't uh, think it through and realize that some people, that's just not their, their personality to speak at a conference and, um, uh, and, and, but I think that's really good that you guys have the luxury to do that. I know some companies try to hire really quickly and get someone in the door, and they do that contract to hire thing where they just bring someone in really quickly um, and see if they fit. And if not, you know, then terminate the contract and move on. Um, but I think w- what you're talking about is having a four week process to really get to know the person, you know, with interviews. And like you said, I guess first it's a kind of a cultural interview, kind of a, you know, see, do you like us? Do we like you? And then it gets in, I guess, later on, you would get into the technical side. So that's actually how it goes is we do that first kind of the cultural. Uh, we talk to them about, hey, well, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, which one? Both acceptable. Uh, <laughs> one preferred over the other. There is one preferred <laughs> over the other. I don't know. If, hold on. Let's see. Oh, you can't see it too well. but Yeah, there's a, I see the Darth Vader in the, in the background there. And uh, that light above your head almost looks like a lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I've got to do something about that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we, we do that cultural portion and then we kind of start that it's, it's, they're brought in for three interviews. Um, so the second interview then is just come back in, talk again, coffee, uh, talk about your experience in tech, give us a little about your background in tech, you know, kind of that start of that tech interview, uh, just kind of get a feel of where they're at. And then we actually bring them in for the third. So once they make it past that, uh, we know, Hey, look, they know what they're talking about. Uh, I always tell everyone, look. I'm not too worried. As long as you know the basics, I can teach you most anything. Culture is more important than anything else. Our third and final one is, is you know, uh, a few of your listeners might uh, get, a, get a kick out of this. I'll, I'll give it away. Our third and final is called the Kobayashi Maru. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a Star Trek reference. We want to know how developers handle failure. Being a software agency, we get in high stress situations where a client comes in and says, look, I I need this now. I've got to have this now. And we say, you know, Brad and I always push back and say, look, you know, that's really, you know, multiple weeks worth of work. You can't have that. And they say, look, we'll, we'll do this, this and this. And we try and work with them. So sometimes it gets really stressful and we say, hey, look, to our devs, we know this is stressful. Can we help? What can we do? But stressful times happen. It happens in any job. So we set up a, a test environment, which there, there's no winning. It is broken by design. And we ask them, how do you fix this? What we're looking for, and this has happened once. One person actually did cheat, as uh, Captain Kirk did, and rewrote the whole thing. The whole test, uh, they rewrote it. And I was just like, well, you, you win, buddy. It's the one time I've seen someone figure it out. In general, what we're looking for, how do they handle the failure of, I don't know. I don't know the answer. They can give us a few solutions, 
but ultimately it's just not fixable. We want them to say, look, this isn't fixable. We need to rethink this solution. Uh, that tells us how someone is going to handle the pressure. Uh, now, we tend to save that for, for junior or senior developers, the entry levels. I don't want to see them go crying off in a corner somewhere. That would be that that would be evil. Um, yeah, that's a little cruel and unusual for a, for a rookie right out of college. Um, but, uh, you know, we do do that for the juniors and senior level people. Uh, and they do it very well. They, it's generally they can say, hey, look, you know, this is not solvable with the parameters you've given. But here is the solution. And that's what we're looking for is just that calm look. This just isn't solvable. So, yeah, we've lovingly called that the Kobayashi Maru. Yeah, so it sounds like even with that, you, you're you still checking culture fit along with the technical side. Um, that's a really good good combination there. Um, that, that's exactly it. We're, we're looking, can you actually display your, your technical knowledge and are you still culturally, can you still culturally fit us when there's stressful times? I wish I could say that there aren't stressful times, but there's always going to be in any environment. Um, product teams, I've seen them get really stressed over launches. Uh, in any company, there's stress, you know, to deny that is to be lying about a company, uh, is how do you handle that is what defines the company and how do your employees handle that is what defines how good of a company you are. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. I think, and and that's one thing we don't really teach people is how do you deal with stress? How do you deal with those situations? I know, um, and and I teach part-time at Winthrop university and even teaching, you know, developers, we don't talk about that. You know, that's something that we probably should teach. We should have a course on how to handle uh, stressful situations because it seems like the the more um, we develop people, the more stress that there is in, in society. And we need to find a way to have people prepared for that situation when they get out there. That is actually the one thing I've discussed. So the interesting thing is, uh, and this isn't a knock on big universities. I mean, I'm wearing University of Tennessee here. Uh, we've noticed that the community colleges, the, the entry levels coming out of there are more prepared to handle stress than those of the bigger universities. Now, of course I went to a bigger university, Arizona state. Uh, it's just interesting. And I'll tell you, I was not prepared for stress, the stress coming out of and going into a development job. Uh, Interestingly enough, the, the community colleges around here are doing a great job of that. They're, they're teaching them how to work in teams from the get-go. Uh, so, you know, I can sit someone down an entry level, and they surprisingly don't need as much hand-holding as, as uh, you know, I'm expecting. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little perspective on that because I also teach part-time at York Technical College right up the road uh, here in uh, it's actually in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And I've taught there for 14 years, and I've been at Winthrop for about 10 now. And one thing I've noticed is there's a different expectation put on the students by administration. Um, at a technical school, it's it's you know you, you get your own stuff. You you're you're off to your own. Um, but at a at least at a four-year university, there's orientation. There's there's how do we get you set up in the right place? Let's let's put you with an RA that you have your meetings with at the beginning that will tell you how to go to to your classes, and and we have an advisor that will set you up. You know, when I was an advisor, I used to teach full time for a while. And when I was an advisor at York Tech, it was just, you know, here are your courses. You go do your own thing. At Winthrop, the advisors are kind of more here. Here's here's what you need to do in order to prepare for your first you know semester and your first year. And it's more hand holding, less warm and fuzzy. Whereas at York Tech, if you don't show up, you don't show up. You know, we're not going to call you and see where you're at. <laughs> that that makes a lot of sense because uh, the people, like I said, coming out of when we hire from the community colleges. I, there's hand holding. There always will be, but it's far less, uh, and they handle the stress better. Yeah, and I love my students at both places. Don't get me wrong, but me. one thing I do notice is that um, there's a percentage of students at a four-year university that don't know why they're there, um, that aren't there for a particular mission, or, or they're there because their parents said, "Hey, we'll pay for you to go to in-state school. Go to in-state school. Let's pick that one because there's more girls over there than there are boys." <laughs> And then you look at uh, a technical school. Most of those students are paying for them 
for it themselves. They yep. have jobs on the side, and they have a clear goal and mission of what they want to do, and they want to get out as fast as they can. They're not there for six years, seven years for a four-year degree. They're like, hey, I'm paying for this. I want to get out, and I'm focused, and I've got a goal, and I've got a mission. Um, and you see that there are some differences that you see out of students out of, out of both of those. And I kind of, you know, getting off on a pretty big tangent here, I'm starting to think that maybe universities two or four years might not be the right thing to do in the future. Uh, there's so much knowledge out there on, you know, Pluralsight or YouTube or all these other online learnings, you know, capabilities that people have. Um, I'm not sure that a degree will be as valuable five, ten years from now as it is today. You know, I keep pondering that. I, I think about my degree, my time. I, I think about my experiences and saying, okay, look what I did. Look how I got here. And I always think to myself, would I have been better off skipping that, doing a two year, doing something different, uh, and launching my developer career earlier? Now, I can't answer that for sure, for certain. Uh, but you know, I look at it, I'm like, what, you know, what can change? How can we make ourselves better? And, and is this still the, the future we need for developers? At least? You know, there's other things, obviously, for your school you need. And then, yeah, I mean, if you're going to be a doctor, I want you to, <laughs> I want you to go yeah, to school no, and not just learn it on YouTube. You know, <laughs> but, my God, you are, you have gone to school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, and, and to some degree in our industry, we see that. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, when I'm hiring and looking, I don't necessarily look and place as much emphasis on your degree as I do your experience. Mm -hmm. I look at that experience heavily and say, oh, look, you've done some really cool stuff uh, versus, hey, you spent X amount of years learning. Um, now, does it weigh in some factors? Yeah. Uh, you know, an architect, I generally am looking for someone who does have that experience. Uh, but if they don't have that or don't have that schooling plus the experience, it's like, all right, let me see how much experience you have. So, you know, now you can't do that if you're an attorney, a physician or something else that yeah. doesn't work quite as well. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely reasons for, uh, for the four year education, but I, I go through the same thoughts and I, I have two master's degree and I used to hire, you know, almost exclusively they had to have a degree. And then one day I met a, uh, a guy who was actually recommended to me from someone at the technical school. I said, hey, you should interview this guy. He doesn't have a degree. He ended up dropping out of technical school, but just interview him. And this is for a um, junior.net developer position. And I met with him. Well, first I saw his resume. You know, he dropped out of high school, got his GED, went to York Tech, dropped out of York Tech, you know, and um, I interviewed him and the kid just blew me away. Like he, he knew some stuff just on a higher level you know there's different levels to things and this kid he, he just he loved code he is like he saw the matrix you know and um i, I hired him he, he i worked with him for you know he worked for me for about three and a half years before he left for another opportunity but man he was so smart and at that point forward i thought you know i gotta throw everything that i thought about you know college degrees and having that college degree before i'll look at you out the window and um and just rethink this because th there are some people that just they can get it without college see and, and to us culture plays a big role into that because if you have that right cultural fit uh to those people you know who like you said see the matrix uh culturally they're they're i don't want to call them nerdy but they they have this cu different culture about them where they love to learn yeah and, and during my interview process that's what i'm really looking for are you are you willing to sit down and learn it's like, hey, if you don't get this, are you gonna obsess over it? And some of our best employees, yeah, they, they if it's something new, man, I'll, I'll catch them, you know, all the time, just trying to understand more, get more, and you know, they'll, you know, when we're working on uh, project management and uh, uh, backlog planning and everything else, uh, they're the first ones saying, hey, that's a new tech. Um, you know, how mission critical is this? Can we start, you know, can you give it to us to work on it? Those are the people I love. Those are the people who I constantly am like, Hey, come here. Let's, let's, I got a job for you. Yeah. And that's information you can't find off of a resume and you can't figure out, you know, based on their diplomas or degrees. That's something that you just get from talking to them. Yeah. Um, so I want to get into some of this new tech that you talked about, because that seems like it's a big part of your, your company, um, doing mobile, 
mobile first development, um, native mo- mobile development, and then you mentioned AR uh, earlier. I want to talk a little bit about what, what are you guys doing with VR and AR? So we're actually doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, it always excites me. Uh, so first of all, we've got all the toys here, HoloLens, Oculus. Uh, we even have uh, Google Glass or something called a Recon. We've got all, all the fun toys. Well, that, that's, uh, that's reason enough to, to apply, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we, we got it all. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what we're actually doing with it is uh, t- two industries. Um, it's medical and utilities. The interesting thing is that these two industries really need help with training. And so they really need some environments in which they can practice in that uh, – and I'm talking, we'll talk, uh, we're talking VR right now. We'll jump back to AR here in a second. Um, and their training is critical because let's, let's talk utility. So they're working on a million dollar generator. It's usually much more. Uh, and one wrong move, the equipment's dead. It's gone. The million dollars is gone. Someone's got to pay for that. Uh, so a lot of these companies have come to us and say, Hey, look, we really need this tool. Now, this tool has not been built before. It's not something we can go and get something off the shelf. Uh, We need a very custom environment made. And so we work with uh, a 3D modeling company who does really awesome stuff. Uh, They also do uh, content, uh, graphics, a lot of cool things. Right, Brad? Is there anything I'm missing that they – Animations. Animations. uh, Throw a quick quick, uh, uh, – we'll enter for them there. Infographics. we do a lot of cool stuff with them. Uh, but these companies need help. Uh, they're, they're wasting millions of dollars. And so the cost savings to have these environments put together where a technician can train uh, saves them so much money. Now, this is stuff that, let's face it, what, uh, five, six years ago? Not really feasible. Not really cost effective. You really couldn't do. The technology wasn't there. Uh, now, you can throw on a pair uh, of, like, you know, the Oculus and be in an environment in which a generator is right in front of you that can step you through the process of repairing it without destroying the thing. Uh, a lot of companies need that, and they've been working with us to, to supply that. Uh, let's shift now to AR, which is also super cool. Um, we have uh, the, the Microsoft HoloLens and Google Glass. Recon's also kind of an AR. And then now we have, uh, oh, what's the new one? Uh, Dave, the, our other co-founder, just purchased a pair or got the reservation. Magic Leap. Uh, Magic Leap's. Is uh, Magic Leap doing anything now? Because I know they've been in the news for a long time, just kind of like, we have something, <laughs> we have something, but it's a mystery. <laughs> It's it's one of those that they've been the the butt of all jokes in the the AR world because it's like, hey, look, guys, there's really cool stuff, but we're not selling anything yet. We'll keep raising money, but nothing's here. Yeah, yeah, it's doing another round of funding, but you can't see anything yet. (laughs) So they actually did finally release a product. They let a bunch of uh, uh, people test it out. You know, they weren't wowed by it. It's kind of like HoloLens, but it's, again, the right step. Now, it's cheaper than the HoloLens. Uh, it, and I can't remember the name of the OS. Like I said, I'm, I'm the mobile guy. Dave is our AR VR expert. He's pretty cool. So if you ever want another uh, podcast with someone, uh, you want AR VR, man, he's the guy to talk to. Uh, he, he's actually leading the charge in our company to, to really develop all that stuff. Uh, he's already got on the pre-order for the new Magic Leap. Um, so he thinks it's cool. I think it's cool. Uh, but anyways, uh, what a lot of companies are looking for there is cost savings. Again, in in the industry that we're in, we're looking to provide cost savings. So in this case, let's take an industrial uh, aspect of a pick and pack uh, factory. They need their employees to get to a certain spot quickly, pick something, put it in a box. Well, now with AR, give them directions show them where to go, tell them what to pick. It scans it, scans a barcode, and says, you picked the right product, now move. So what they've done is they've kind of timed these things and figured out, okay, 
if we give the employee the typical packing sheet, let them walk around versus putting these goggles on, giving them the directions, how much time are we saving? How many more boxes can we pack and ship? And, and the cost savings is just amazing. Wow. So what they can eventually do is actually cut down on employees because the current employees are becoming so efficient in what they're doing that it doesn't take as many employees. So there's immediate cost benefits, and then another benefits are they don't pick the wrong thing. Um, so an example, so take this from medical, something that we've been involved with before is uh, nurses have to, and other people have to pick things from a closet, medical supply closet, fill a cart. If they pick something wrong, well, that's a problem. And, you know, insurance gets charged, people get charged, and can't be used if it goes in the wrong room. I mean, we all know all that craziness. Well, using this technology, they know exactly what they're getting. They know where it's supposed to be, and they scan it. So, again, it goes down to cost savings. Uh, and, and, you know, do we see a lot of consumer-facing stuff right now? Not really. I'm sure there will be. But that's just not where our businesses. Right. And that cost savings, I mean, it's also for, for medical, that could be life saving too. You know, they're picking the right things, the right medicines or the right whatever. Um, so yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty neat. So um, the fact that you say that's actually one of the reasons why one of our projects was funded was, uh, I, I, I don't know the exact numbers. They kind of threw them at me and I was just like, Oh my gosh, uh, it is life saving. And what happens is the cost of one of the lawsuits uh, and what they pay out basically pays for the project in one go. And so they, they, it's one of those, they have a hard time determining the actual savings and costs, but they're like, look, you saved one life. You've saved this hospital millions of dollars. Wow. That's, that's neat. I was actually um, talking to a guy. He's a CT, one of the CTOs at, um, um, at IBM, apparently they have different CTOs for different groups or, or something like that. But he was talking about some of the things that they're doing with um, with uh, AI and sort of in an augmented reality way. He was talking about something that they had in their labs where you could put this app on your phone and it has enhanced camera lens that would attach to it and they could take a picture of like lettuce or food and it would tell you does this lettuce have e coli in it you know or anything like that just because wow. it could zoom in and see the bacteria and the patterns within the bacteria. At, at such a level, could, could you imagine taking that out to a restaurant <laughs> and just looking down, and be like, "Nope, not eating tonight." Yeah, exactly. And he was saying that they're working on something to where, using AI, they could just scan like uh, all the food that comes out, you know, at your dish. And they're doing this for like kids. They could just, you know, scan and take a picture of the food, and it would tell you like the ingredients to know if there's any food allergies. Like the, the likelihood that this, you know, pie has nuts in it is, you know, a twelve percent likelihood that you know so you might not want to eat it if you have peanut allergy or something like that there, there's a lot of cool things going on with ai we're actually kind of uh toying with some things around here we're, we're uh playing with tensorflow and then you know obviously microsoft has their their offerings and everyone else uh th there's a lot of cool things there uh we see that as another potential for some really good revenue for code tank labs uh but i let honestly I let Dave play. I let him figure out and tell me, hey, man, this is really cool stuff. This will make us some money. Uh, he He's super busy right now with all the AR and VR stuff, but he's been uh, chomping at the bit to to start playing with more TensorFlow. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so I do want to ask a question since um, you are kind of in the, the throw of hiring people and probably uh, like me whenever you get resumes in, you kind of see a variety of different um, – looks and feels of resumes and i've asked this with a couple of other guests in the past but what do you want to look for when you're looking at a resume and what do you look at and you say oh that's such a red flag why would anybody put that on the resume so i'll, I'll tell you the biggest red flag i see are job jumpers mm -hmm. people who go from greenfield tech to greenfield tech to greenfield tech i appreciate that i really think that's cool but if i see that you're switching a job every you know year and a half Again, like, and again, you know, it's kind of creepy. I want people to be here for a while to level themselves up. I want them to leave uh, having leveled up to a point where they feel like, hey, I came in as a junior, but I'm leaving as a senior. I'm happy. Uh, if I see that every year, year and a half, they're jumping to another job, that immediately tells me they're probably not a good fit. Um, 
obviously the the easy one is when they just smatter all the technologies out there. Uh, that tells me that they haven't, you know, really learned one technology. You know, if they say, if, if I see a, a resume that just says, hey, you know, JavaScript, Angular, um, React, and they kind of list some of the web technologies, but not all of them. I know, okay, look, they, they know what they're talking about. Let me bring them in. And of course, has that good work history where it's like, hey, look, you know, I've stayed around for a couple of years and then I've moved around. Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm, I'm looking at whenever I get a resume is ha have they been at a place? Because there's different reasons for jumping around. You know, it may be that you you know want new technology, but it also may be that people don't like you. <laughs> you know, that, that is the, the big thing. I mean, I'll still bring them in if I feel like they have something else to offer just to see, because it could be they might be that person who fits culturally here, but didn't fit. They were like, OK, so I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, if I see they keep going from big corporation to big corporation to big corporation, that tells me, look, they might not be meant for cubicle life. Yeah. yeah. They might want to be, and and we lovingly, jokingly call it the, the dev pit here, where you get to work side by side with developers. We also have private rooms here if you need to work privately. Uh, the, the unassigned office and unassigned meeting rooms where it's like, look, do you need to you know work privately or do you need to work together as a team? Um, it, it, that is one thing I do look at is like, look, if you're jumping from big company to big company, it could just be you just weren't meant for the, the cubicle life. Some people just have a hard time doing that. Uh, they're not a big fan of that, and they don't like working just by themselves. And some of those jobs, that's what you do. You're kind of stuck siloed by yourself, and that's just not who they want to be. Yeah, and I've also seen I've, – I've had a, I hired a person that was at a big company for – um, and he kind of jumped around between, uh, you know, bank to bank to, to bank. <laughs> um, and then when we got him, it, he, I asked him during the interview, I was like, uh, I noticed, you know, you haven't been anywhere for more than like 18 months. And he said, yeah, I just, I, I, I get so bored doing the same thing over and over again. And I want to expand and do more things. And it's like when I get shoehorned into one product and not even one whole product but one little tiny bit of a product then that's all the thing i can code against it just gets boring for me after a little little bit of time and then we i hired him and before i left to come to this job i was at my last company for nine and a half years and uh he worked for me for five years before i had left and he's still there now so yeah sometimes it's like that it's just the not not the right fit and that's one of the things i love to tell uh, people who come join here is because we're an agency, we're always seeing new technologies. We're always seeing something different. Uh, our lead just loves it because he's always getting to touch new things uh, and different, you know, it's, you're just not on one product forever. If you get to see something new, you get to learn something new. And again, that goes back to you. That's why culture is such a big, important thing for us. Yeah, that's really good. Um, before we, we leave, I do want to ask uh, a couple more things. One, um, do you have any advice for new leaders, new team leads, uh, people that just started an agency or just now starting to hire people or anything like that that can help them with the, the leadership in general that, that you see that, you know, isn't something you typically find in books or isn't something that most people talk about? Well, one of the big things is if you're looking for a partner, trust them. Trust the results. If they're giving you good results, believe in it. Uh, the other thing is just trust your gut. You, you got to follow your gut and know when things are going right and wrong. Uh, it's really tough running an agency. Do not get discouraged. It, it is, you know, management wise, there's going to be times when you want to pull your hair out. I don't have much left. Um, but get through it. All the, the bad times does not outweigh all the great times. There's so much great things that go on and so much you get to learn. Uh, the other thing is make smart hires. Don't hire just because you have an open position. If that means you have to work a little bit harder that month, work a little bit harder. If you just hire to fill, you're gonna be constantly filling that position. Uh, I'll be honest, what I feel like has contributed to our success is our hiring practices. 
is that we want to make sure who comes in here is someone who's going to be a great fit. Uh, and that's tough. That's not, you know, when as a leader, you have to work those extra hours. That's tough. That's draining on your family. That's draining on yourself. And, and you're tempted to say, hey, you know, what? I'm just going to put a butt in the seat. But if you do that, you're really hurting yourself in the long run. And you're going to hurt your clients, too, because that person might not be the right fit and might not be writing great code. And that leads to bad things. Yeah, no, that's good advice. Um, and then I wanted to ask Brad uh, if you could just give us a little plug for Code Stock because I'm, I'm a huge fan of Code Stock. I'll probably be there next year unless something crazy comes up. Uh, you know, what can we expect? Yeah, we'll, uh, we're about a month and a half into planning. Uh, we're going to announce the dates, I think, the coming up first of next week and uh, hopefully be able to announce our keynote within the next four to six weeks as well. So uh, working on some great stuff, a couple new things on the horizon, but uh, still striving to have this same great community feel that it's had for the past 12 years and uh, just continue to uh, focus on that and welcoming people in and delivering great content. All right. Well, I'll definitely put some links in the show notes and hopefully some people will uh, find it from there and uh, enjoy another great year. Appreciate it. Thank you. Right. I'm excited about Code Stock. I'll be honest. Think about where it came from. About 100 ish people at a Tiny Community College is where it started, all the way to the Knoxville Convention Center and about 1,000 people roaming around and, and getting to learn and enjoy the community. Yeah, I want to say 2000, 2010 was probably my first year there, and then I didn't go back for a couple years, and then uh, it's been more regularly, re- regular since then. So 2010, I'm trying to remember what year that was. They, they used to have some really crazy shirts. Uh, mm. Man, I can't remember what shirt that was. There was some crazy stuff. Uh, I, I can't remember either. I don't know if it was, I had a blue one, uh, several gray ones. Um, the pig one was a few years ago. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great community event. Yeah. It's, it's, I'm excited for them to continue to grow and, and, and just really make it an exciting, fun community event for all developers. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time. Uh, how can people find out more about code tank and code stock? So for Code Tank, just go to our website, uh, codetanklabs.com. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Honestly, I'll give everyone my email address, am at codetanklabs.com. Reach out to me. I'm always excited to talk to new people. Uh, Brad, do you want to quickly give a plug? Yeah, uh, you can check out our website at codestock.org. Um, we've got a pretty active uh, Twitter manager at, uh, at Codestock on Twitter. Uh, give Chris Ann a shout and uh She's pretty active on there, replying to questions and on different people's content. So she's pretty funny too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of personality. <laughs> Lots of personality. She's pretty awesome. Well, that's great. I appreciate your time, guys. Hey, thank you so much. Hey, guys, John, back again. I hope you guys enjoyed that talk with Andrew May and uh, Brad Miller. Um, I do want to give one more plug for Code Stock. The dates have been released since we recorded. They're in April. Um, it's April 12th and 13th of 2019. Uh, Code Stock's a great conference for first-time speakers. If you're interested in speaking but you've never given it a shot, that'd be a great place to uh, put your proposal in. Um, uh, we learn a lot in between sessions as well as at the sessions. I've been going to Code Stock for a number of years now, and I get a lot out of it. So I highly recommend people going to Code Stock, and I'll definitely link that up in the show notes. Also, if you could, head over to iTunes, uh, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your shows, and please leave me a rating, review, subscribe, uh, and share with your friends. Um, the numbers have been going up steadily uh, recently, and I'd like to keep that progress going. So um it's, it's great if you guys just share the episodes with your friends. Thanks so much.